Welcome back to an in-depth playthrough of Bungie's Operation Desert Storm. In the last video we talked a little bit about the gameplay and other general information about the game. In this video we will be diving into some of the information about the war itself. I thought this would make the most sense because the point of the game after all is to have some fun with your tank while you learn information about the Gulf War and the Middle East. If you want to learn more details about the war, there are some good documentaries out there. To prepare for this video, I watched one from BBC and also read some things here and there to answer specific questions I had. If you want to know more specifically about the battles themselves, I found a really good YouTube channel called The Operation Room that I would highly recommend. He basically animates the whole war on a map and talks about specific details of each part of the battle extremely detailed videos. I will put some links in the description for you guys to check out. Now let's discuss the war. The Gulf War was one of the first wars that was heavily televised on the news. There are videos all over the internet about the war. It gave history its first glimpse of what war might be like in the 21st century, and it allowed Americans to banish its ghost from Vietnam. America's poor experience in Vietnam will play a major factor in the outcome of this war. One of the main contributors to the start of this war was that Iraq was in severe financial trouble. Not to mention that Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq at the time and was also very power hungry and wanted to expand his borders. Their natural target was Kuwait for a few reasons. Kuwait borders Iraq and they had a much weaker military than Iraq. Iraq also had a beef with Kuwait relating to their borders as Iraq barely had any access on their border to the Persian Gulf and geographically Kuwait was blocking them off. There was a long history going all the way back to the 1930s and possibly even earlier of Iraq trying to claim Kuwait's land. Iraq believed that Kuwait should have been their land for one reason or another based on the Ottoman empire boundaries. Anyways, Iraq was going to be bankrupt in a few months and Kuwait had one tenth of the world's oil within its borders. To start the dispute off, Saddam warned Kuwait to stop dropping the price of oil by overselling. When Kuwait didn't adequately appeal to Saddam's warnings, Saddam then accused Kuwait of stealing oil from them by drilling their oil wells laterally. I don't know if this accusation was actually based on anything substantial or not. Because of their severe lack of finances though, Saddam continued to elevate the situation and demanded that Kuwait hand over 10 billion dollars or they would be invaded. Now backing up a bit, the main reason that Iraq is in such financial issues is because of the Iran-Iraq war that lasted from 1980 to 1988. This war had at least half a million casualties and several billion dollars worth of damages. The war was started by Saddam Hussein invading Iran and though the war lasted so long, neither side really gained anything in the end. Some say that Saddam invaded because he feared a spillover effect from the Iranian revolution that ended in 1979. This revolution was largely religious and in which they replaced a monarchy within an Islamic Republic. The Shiite population that was rapidly growing within Iraq as a result of the revolution was hostile to Saddam's dictatorship. On top of this, Saddam likely strongly disliked Iran because of these religious reasons and likely also wanted to gain more power by conquering some of Iran's land. Anyways, during the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq gained financial support from several Arab countries and even gained help from the US who provided some financial and strategic intelligence to Iran. Even though America thought of Saddam as a dictator and terrorist, they still supported Iraq in the war because they saw the rise of the Shia to power in the Middle East as a threat to their oil production. Now as you would imagine, after being at war for 8 years, Iraq was in financial despair. To put some things in perspective, in 1988 Iraq's military spending equal to roughly 7 billion dollars and 26.8% of its gross national product. 
In 1988, Iraq was the fifth largest army in the world with 1 million active soldiers and 650,000 reserves. Without the financial support of the United States and other Arab nations, this would not have been possible for them. Coming out of the war with such a large military and such financial ruin, it is not surprising at all that a ruler like Saddam would attempt to use Iraq's military strength to fill his empty pockets. On July 22, 1990, Iraq began moving troops to the border to put the pressure on Kuwait to hand over the demanded $10 billion. In response, the Arab world sent the President of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, to discuss Saddam's plans with the troops at the border. Saddam told Hosni that he had no intention of evading Kuwait and was bluffing. He told him to not give this information to Kuwait, however. Hosni reported that Saddam was bluffing to the U.S. President George W. Bush, and also, against Saddam's wishes, informed the Emir of Kuwait, Jabar el Sabah, of the bluff. It makes you wonder if leaking this information influenced Saddam to attack Kuwait or whether he was planning to attack all along if he didn't get financial support. If it was part of his plan all along, it would make sense to bluff because it would tend to keep other world powers out of the conflict early on. After all, the Arab nations told the United States to stay out of these affairs early on because they didn't want them to get involved and provoke Iraq. Sudan believed that the U.S. would not get involved because of their very poor experience in the Vietnam War. On August 2nd, a week and a half later, Iraq invaded Kuwait with the intention of setting up their own government. With the oil control in Kuwait, Iraq was a major threat in the Middle East. Kuwait's army was standing down prior to the invasion as to not provoke Sudan, which may have been another strategic advantage of Sudan lying about only bluffing. Luckily, the Emir of Kuwait, Jabir al Sabah, was able to escape to Saudi Arabia with just minutes to spare by car in rush hour traffic. If Sudan would have captured the Emir, they would likely have killed him with poison. After taking over Kuwait, Iraq's forces turned south towards the Saudi Arabia barrier and the world wondered whether Sudan planned to continue on the invasion into Saudi Arabia in the near future. The United States was able to capture this movement by spies in Iraq and also by satellite. America was generally not interested in joining the war and George W. Bush wasn't sure if he would do anything about it. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time, Margaret Thatcher, was adamant that Sudan was a major threat and had to be stopped. She thought that Sudan could become some sort of Hitler in the Middle East. George W. Bush and Margaret Thatcher met up and had a chat and she was able to persuade the president that America needed to take action. If America was going to take action, though, they were going to make for certain they had a very clear objective so that they did not make the same mistakes that they made in Vietnam. There would be nothing wishy-washy about their course of action. America wanted to put their soldiers in Saudi Arabia to prevent Iraq from being able to invade. Saudi Arabia was not sure whether they wanted help from America because they had poor experiences in the past with America, showing signs of weakness in their commitment when the going got tough. After meeting with the King of Saudi Arabia, Fahd bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud, George W. Bush was able to convince them to let America aid them. Several countries joined the war against Iraq, stacking the odds against them. The primary members of the coalition included the United States, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, and the French. 38 countries joined the coalition in total, with 28 nations contributing troops. Sending soldiers to Iraq for war was one of Margaret Thatcher's last commands as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. America gave Iraq an ultimatum to withdraw from Kuwait or pay the consequences. Saddam didn't budge though, believing that if the coalition were to attack, that he would win the war. Before America would lay on the offensive though, George W. Bush had to work out the politics back home. Overall, the American population was still against the war. The fact that Saddam ruled with terror in Kuwait, just like he did in Iraq, helped paint the war as righteous cause for the American people. The Iraqi soldiers looted the wealth of Kuwait and treated the people who lived there very harshly. 
Many Americans protested against the war in the streets in hopes that Congress would vote against the war. To try to gain the support of the war back home, George W. Bush sent the Secretary of State Jim Baker to Baghdad to meet with Saddam Hussein. This was a desperate move as some of Americans' allies in the coalition were angry about the move and they were not consulted about it. The fear was that Iraq would offer a peace deal, which would not help with the American people's support, and the coalition had no interest in trying to compromise on their ultimatum. If Iraq made a peace deal and the US rejected it, then American support for the war would likely dwindle farther. In fact, even Colin Powell, who would later become the Secretary of State, advised George Bush to use sanctions rather than evade Iraq because he feared that winning the war would also destroy the stability in the Middle East. Anyways, six days after the ultimatum for war, Jim Baker met the Iraqi Foreign Minister Tarek Aziz. Iraq knew that this meeting was just a show for Baker to tell Congress that he tried to work things out in order to gain approval for the war. Baker brought a letter for Iraq demanding their withdrawal from Kuwait and that the US would use nuclear weapons against Iraq if Iraq used any nuclear weapons that they may have had. Aziz told Baker that this was a letter of threat and that he would not accept it. Saddam believed he could survive this upcoming war without compromising. With Baker's message back to Congress that Iraq refused to agree to the terms of their letter, support for the war grew. The vote for the war passed the Senate 52 to 47 and also passed Congress 250 to 183. The Republicans were mostly unanimous in their support for the war and several Democrats abandoned their party stands in support. The alternative vote in Congress was to use sanctions instead of going to war, which did not pass. While all Americans wished they could have avoided war, at this point it seemed like there would be no reasonable dealing with Sudan. If the vote had not passed, Bush likely would have gone to war anyways and risk impeachment. To start the war on January 17th, US helicopters destroyed a couple of satellites in southern Iraq that would keep Iraq from knowing what was going on. After the helicopters, the Navy in the Persian Gulf fired shots that went into Iran and then turned toward Baghdad. These missiles couldn't be navigated over the featureless terrain in Iraq, so they used the mountains within Iran without their knowledge or approval. This was the first time these type of missiles were used, so there was some concern about whether they would function properly. The US didn't want to bring other countries into the war accidentally. The goal was to destroy many strategic points in Iraq from air and some from boat prior to the full-on invasion. Operation Desert Storm had begun. The coalition planes would continue to lay waste to Iraq's air defenses, communications, and other strategic targets with little opposition for a little over a month before the ground invasion. When the airstrike began, the Iraqi radars were jammed by US aircrafts forcing the Iraqi anti-aircraft guns to shoot wildly into the night, hoping that they would luckily hit the attacking aircrafts. The few pilots that had their aircrafts destroyed would have to eject into the Iraqi desert that spans for many miles, only to have Iraqi forces sprawl on them, trying to kill them. A few were taken prisoner, which in a way was scarier than death. While the coalition would attempt to kill Saddam in the airstrikes, it was virtually impossible to know where he would be at night because he would sleep at a different private house every night. He would often travel by taxi or other random vehicles, making it impossible to catch him during the day also. The coalition was only able to catch where he had been previously. After the coalition's air attack, Iraq responded by launching scud missiles at Israel. These scud missiles were often hidden in the heart of the desert and were thus very hard to find. Saddam's hope was that Israel would enter the war and thus disband the Arab nations from the coalition because of their refusal to fight together. None of these scud missiles contained dangerous chemicals though, as they feared that if they had, Israel would have responded with nuclear weapons. In the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq had used chemical weapons and the world did not look kindly on their actions. George Bush called the Israeli Prime Minister Yishak Shamir. At the time, Israel and America were not on good terms. Israel warned America that if 
America did not stop the Scud missiles, that Israel would be forced to stop them with their air force. Israel was hesitant to enter the war itself because they knew the Arabs would leave the coalition if they had. America did their best to find the Scud missiles, but they had a lot of trouble doing so. Iraq would transport them in buses with the seats removed, making them difficult to target. America would constantly patrol the area close to the border so that they could investigate any movement that could possibly be Scud missiles. In addition, America would launch Patriot missiles to intercept them. The Patriot missiles became a symbol of the resistance. However, in reality, the Patriot missiles were largely ineffective against the Scud missiles, and they were not even designed to intercept them in reality. The Patriot missiles were designed to shoot down aircrafts. The Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Arons informed America that at best they were successful at stopping 20% of the Scud missiles, but it was likely much worse than even that. The damage caused by the Scud missiles was not reported to the Israelite population as to prevent Iraq from knowing how much damage they were causing. The myth that the Patriot missiles were working successfully at stopping the Scud missiles would help keep the people of Israel becoming angry and thus forcing them to join the war. After the war, the Pentagon acknowledged that the Patriot missiles did not work at stopping the Scud missiles. To counter the air attacks, Iraq also launched an attack on the city of Kafi in Saudi Arabia hoping to capture civilians to strap to their military vehicles to stop the coalition from bombing them. Little did they know that Kafi had been abandoned. There were some US Marines that were hidden in Kafi that the Iraq soldiers never spotted even though they got as close to them as they could have thrown a rock at them. These Marines helped destroy numerous vehicles that were in Kafshi by giving coordinates to the U.S. Army. Later on, Saudi Arabia attacked the Iraqi forces at the city and easily took them out since they had no air backup. The coalition began to make plans for the ground invasion. General Herbert Norman Schwarzkopf Jr. was in charge of the ground invasion and wasn't originally happy with the plans to invade because the Iraqi outnumbered the coalition 2-1. to one. They had originally gone there just to defend Saudi Arabia and not to invade. Colin Powell assured the general that he would get whatever he needed for the ground invasion, and then went to the president with a request for more soldiers. George Bush was all in for the war and gave them all the forces that they wanted. If anything, America was going to go overboard to assure that they did not have a repeat of Vietnam. The coalition gave Iraq another ultimatum to withdraw from Kuwait or face a ground invasion. Just like the other ultimatum, Iraq refused to respond and the ultimatum would come and pass resulting in the ground invasion commencing. The plan was to trap the Iraqi forces in Kuwait and prevent their escape. To start the war, the forces would invade Kuwait and would also bluff an amphibious assault forcing the Iraqi army to respond and strengthen its defenses in Kuwait. Then the rest of the coalition forces to the west would invade and transverse the land quickly cutting off the Iraqi forces escape. Colin Powell has a famous quote describing this plan. We are going to cut it off and then we are going to kill it. Prior to the ground invasion, the elite Republican Guard for Iraq was located somewhere on the north side of Kuwait. It was a higher priority for Schwarzkopf to get these forces to go into Iraq so that they could cut them off and take them out. These forces were Saddam's strongest and destroying them would severely weaken Saddam's strength over the Iraqi people. Saddam believed that he could win the battle man to man and he also believed that the United Kingdom and the United States relied too much on their technology. He believed that if he forced a bloody stalemate with Americans, that it would greatly discourage them because of their past experiences in Vietnam. He did still have 400,000 soldiers at that time, so he had some reason to remain confident. He had one major miscalculation though, and that was that the airstrikes had severely destroyed the morale of his troops. Talk of retreat was punishable by death. Yet that would not be able to hold his troops together with such low morale. Yet, 
Despite this, a large portion of the Iraqi army had actually already deserted their post because of the bombing. One group had reportedly dropped from 15,000 soldiers to only 34. The coalition was unaware of the large amount of desertion in Iraq. In anticipation of possibly losing Kuwait, over the last month Saddam had burned many of Kuwait's oil fields and dumped oil in the Persian Gulf. I am sure that their thought was that at the very least they would prevent Kuwait from selling oil and thus improve the price of the oil they sold. On February 24th, the coalition began their ground invasion. The ground invasion was much easier than the coalition had expected. They had been worried about chemical warfare, but none such existed. In addition, the Iraqi forces quickly surrendered as they didn't believe in the war, and also their morale had already been completely shattered by the constant airstrikes. The success was going so well that Schwarzkopf worried that the Kuwait invasion would get too far ahead of the Western Front and thus his plan to cut off the elite Republican Guard would fail. He pressured the Western Front to move as quickly as possible and they were able to cut off the main road out of Kuwait to the West. Fortunately, they were able to cut off this road in time. Shortly after the start of the invasion, Saddam ordered the retreat of Kuwait. There were thousands of headlights on the road out of Kuwait. The Air Force quickly struck with their bombs and created a huge traffic jam with all the vehicles virtually defenseless against the bombing and destruction. It was completely devastating. It got to the point where the coalition had to stop bombing them because it was just too inhumane to continue. They wanted to bomb enough though to make sure that Saddam did not have a military to continue to back him. The US tanks met up with some of the elite Republican Guard at the Battle of Medina Ridge. In that battle, 300 Iraqi tanks were destroyed with only one American casualty. Very few of the Iraqis survived from that battle. The Americans were much better trained in how to use their tanks and their tanks were also far superior and could shoot much farther. With so much devastation to Saddam's forces, the Iraqi people saw an opportunity to begin revolting. Random and unorganized revolting against Saddam's cruelty arose against the remaining Iraqi forces. The coalition did not want to get involved in the uprising as things would have quickly begun to get very complicated. The US did not want to go into Baghdad to find Saddam because they would have gotten sucked into repairing infrastructure and restoring stability to Iraq. If America had chosen to go into Baghdad, it is unlikely that our allies would have supported us in it. Because of this decision, Saddam was able to go free and was able to restore stability in Iraq after the coalition had left. The invasion had gone much better in the Vietnam for two main reasons. America had a clear goal in what it wanted to do and understood the risks of getting involved without a clear plan. And the other main reason is that the Iraqi forces were not willing to die for their cause like the opposition in Vietnam. This war had gone much better, but it shouldn't be taken as an indication that America is so powerful that they can just roll over their enemies. There are specific reasons that this war had gone so well. Now, that is it for this video. What is your opinion of the Gulf War? Should America and the coalition have gotten involved to kick Saddam out of Kuwait? Would Saddam have continued his evasion into Saudi Arabia? Was there anything important about the war that you think I left out? Let me know in the comments. In the next video, we will start playing Bungie's Operation Desert Storm. See you all then.